Apart from a minority of people who were willing to give Tenet a second watch just to properly assess their feelings about it before making a final judgement, it seems to me that the IMDB reviews of the film clearly indicate that it is one of those movies which either enraptures or infuriates the movie watching public. People seem to either love it or loathe it, and those in the loathe it group are unflinching in their harsh critiques of the film and its creator. For me, Tenet is another cinematic masterpiece from Christopher Nolan. The storytelling is even more intricate than Inception was, and the narrative is punctuated with action set pieces that would rival anything that he has done previously. Most importantly of all, as with all of Nolan's blockbusters, there is something deeper and more meaningful going on beneath the surface. But, as I said, the film has its critics, and there seems to be three main recurring lines of complaint about this movie from its detractors. Firstly, a lot of complaints seem to revolve around people's frustrations with the confusing nature of the plot. For me, this wasn't the major issue that I had been led to believe it would be going into the movie. My experience was that if you give the film your full attention, you won't be left confused after your first viewing of it. The important plot points will all be obvious and they will all make sense. However, this is a Nolan film, and one thing that I really appreciate about his storytelling style is that he doesn't treat us, his audience, like idiots. What this means is that Tenet is a film that you will definitely need to watch more than once to get a full appreciation for its amazing storytelling creativity and depth. And it also means that if you take your eye off the ball during this film, even for just a minute or two, you will miss important pieces of the puzzle that are necessary in making sense of the intricate story that it is telling. In an effort to help us, Nolan actually seeded this film with an initial warning not to become too fixated on the logic of the time travel component of Tenet. You see, this story is experienced by us through the eyes of the main protagonist, who is literally called the protagonist in this film. And in the very first act, he, and by default we, the audience, are literally told, don't try to understand it, feel it. To which our main protagonist responds, instinct, got it. In other words, Nolan is telling us don't get too hung up on the time travel mechanism, just go with it. And if you follow that simple piece of advice and keep your eye on the ball the whole time, even though you will definitely have some questions at the end, the plot won't be a horribly convoluted mess for you by the time the final credits roll. Another complaint I've heard a lot about this film relates to the sound engineering, and this time I think there is actually validity to these concerns. There were one or two moments where the dialogue was so overwhelmed by the rest of the audio in a scene that what a character was saying became hard to hear or even inaudible. The most obvious one of these moments for me was the line of dialogue uttered by Cat on the catamaran before she tries to kill Sator by pushing him overboard. This type of sound design is a Nolan peculiarity, in fact it's a quirk that he openly acknowledges now, and unfortunately that means that the only way around it is to watch the film with subtitles on the first time around. The third and final complaint that keeps cropping up in criticisms of Tenet is the suggestion that the acting of the lead character, played by John David Washington, son of the legendary Denzel Washington, was too wooden. I really struggled to understand that criticism. I didn't think there was anything particularly bland about his acting performance in this film. In fact, it struck me as being pretty good for the role that he was playing and the story that is being told. This is definitely not a movie where you want a bombastic lead who is stealing all of the oxygen by chewing on the scenery whenever they are on screen. Not only would that be a distraction that would just make things harder for us to decipher, but it would also be contrary to the story that is being told in Tenet. Firstly, this film is an enigma wrapped in a riddle, and so our main protagonist, who has been thrust into the centre of that reality-altering mystery, should never be too sure of himself. Instead, his performance should convey a more cautious and reserved tone, which is exactly what John David Washington gives us in Tenet, and by doing so, he becomes a perfect proxy for us, the audience. Secondly, and even more importantly, despite being called the protagonist in this film, he isn't actually the only main protagonist in the story at all. In fact, Nolan literally tells us this in the final act of the film. During a conversation with Priya, Washington's character boldly asserts, I'm the protagonist of this operation. 
To which Priya replies, you are a protagonist. Did you think you were the only one capable of saving the world? She then literally scoffs at him after telling him this. Remember, the character of the protagonist is a proxy for us, the audience. So she is telling us in the clearest way possible that Washington is not playing a typical lead and this is not a typical story that is being told here. Which brings me to a really vital piece of the puzzle which I think is necessary for understanding Tenet. The word Tenet is taken directly from something called a Sata Square. A Sata Square is a two-dimensional word square containing a five-word Latin palindrome. And all five words found on the Sata Square are used prominently in this film. Not only that, but the word which appears in the very centre of the Sata Square is none other than Tenet, the very title of the movie. The other words in the Sata Square are Sata, which is the last name of the main antagonist Andre Sater, played by Kenneth Branagh. Opera, which is the code word used for the plutonium 241 in Tenet, and an opera house is also the venue of the terrorist attack in the opening act of the film. Arepo, which is the name of the unseen art forger who creates the fraudulent Goya artworks in Tenet. And Rotus, which is the name of the security company protecting the Freeport art storage building featured in the airport heist. And here's the really important thing about the Sata Square. It is a four-directional palindrome, which means that it can be read exactly the same from four different directions. Not only that, but the words in the first and the fifth line are exactly the same, just inverted, as are the words in the second and fourth line. And the word on the third and centre line of the square, tenet, is itself a palindrome, it reads the same backwards as it does forwards. If you haven't got the point of all of this yet, here it is. It's not just the title of Tenet that is a palindrome, the entire film is actually a palindrome. This is Christopher Nolan's Sata Square. It contains all five of the Sata's Latin words and tells the same story backwards as it does forwards. This film is an embodiment of the very concept of Tenet that is the central plot device it uses. I'm not even sure what to call this. It's not quite breaking the fourth wall and it's not quite non-linear storytelling. With Tenet, when you watch the film, you're actually watching something which defies the concept of time, as this is a story which is literally being told, or put another way, is traveling in two different directions at the same time. So, to borrow an expositional device used in a scene from early in the film, you can either see this story from the perspective of the bullet, or you can see it from the perspective of the hand. The bullet is inverted and travelling backwards through the story, while the hand is travelling through the story in the exact opposite and forward-facing direction. Which brings me back to a vitally important point. The protagonist is not the only protagonist in this story. You see, if you were to invert the film and watch it backwards, the character of Neil, played by Robert Pattinson, becomes the main protagonist. In fact, if you watch the film backwards, Neil's final act in the story would be to save the life of the protagonist in the Opera House terrorist attack. Oh, and the name Neil literally means champion. But here's the important bit. This still remains the story of the protagonist, the one played by Washington, whether you watch it forwards or whether you watch it in reverse. The change of protagonist from Washington to Pattinson is simply a change in perspective, because it is still Washington's character who is the central player causing all of the events which unfold in the story. He is the hand, and Neil is the bullet. Or, put another way, he is the cause, and Neil becoming the protagonist is an effect that Washington's character causes to happen in the story. Nolan alerts us to the reality of this palindrome when he has the character of Ives tell the protagonist during the final act, don't get on the chopper if you can't stop thinking in linear terms. Once again, that's a message that's intended for us, the audience. In fact, there's quite a bit of important foreshadowing in Tenet about the non-linear nature of time and perspective in this story. At the very start, Tenet opens with three consecutive shots where the camera tracks backwards out of the scenes. All three of these are establishing shots, and in all three, the camera movement is reversing backwards. 
So these opening shots aren't just establishing important locations, people and events, they are also telling us that our movement through this story is non-linear. We are moving in reverse and moving forward at the exact same time. Just like the camera, we, the audience, are literally moving in the opposite direction to the flow of time in these events. Cinematography is being used here as a tool to foreshadow the palindrome of the story. Then there is the scene in the hotel where the protagonist first meets Neil. Not only does Neil ask the protagonist if he would take a woman or a child hostage, a reference to the soon-to-be-revealed characters of Cat and her son Max, who are held hostage by Andre Sator, but he also says, time isn't the problem, it's getting out alive that's the problem. This is an obvious piece of foreshadowing about the role which Neil will play in this story as the character who eventually sacrifices himself to save the life of the protagonist, and in doing so, ultimately saves the entire world. And consider how the use of a reverse bungee jump from the ground to get to the top of a very tall building is a type of foreshadowing of inversion, which will be unveiled later in the film. Just like the reverse bungee sees Neil and the protagonist travelling against the normal restraints of gravity, so inversion allows them both to travel against the normal restraints of time. Then there is the scene on the catamaran where the protagonist takes control of the boat and suddenly swings it about 180 degrees and then starts speeding back in the exact opposite direction. As he is doing this, Cat yells at him, you can't jibe a boat like this, to which he yells back, you can if you have to. This isn't just foreshadowing about the way in which Cat will prematurely kill Sator at the end of the film, it is also foreshadowing how the protagonist will soon, and very abruptly and unconventionally, begin travelling in a reverse direction through time in order to try and get to Sator. When you think about it, if you consider the concept of travel on a boat in terms of it being a passage, the traditional term for a journey on a boat, and the fact that our linear progression through history is also commonly referred to as the passage of time, you realise that the catamaran scene is a very clever metaphor for the time-travelling device and the plot of Tenet. Just as the blue team will invert and travel backwards in time in the final act, so the blue catamaran suddenly inverts itself and travels back along the same line it has just traversed. And just like the characters in this story, it does all of that in pursuit of Sator. Speaking of the time-travel mechanism in Tenet, the more I think about it, the more I consider it to be one of the best conceptual presentations of travelling through time I've ever seen in a film. It's really so simple, you literally just step into a portal that allows you to begin reversing your way in the opposite direction through events that have already unfolded in the past. This isn't about a character suddenly and magically jumping from one point in time to another point in time. This is about a character having to make their way back or make their way forward to a particular point on the timeline by reversing the direction in which they are currently travelling along that line. So if you consider that boat scene again, we are like the catamaran, time is like the water that the boat travels in, and the events in our lives are like coordinates that you can either travel to or depart from on that ocean of time. Another thing about the Sata Square is that it was a symbol used by the early persecuted Christians as a secret way of signalling their presence to each other. It was used as a tool to declare the omnipresence of God in a coded way that only other Christians would recognise. You see, when you rearrange all the letters in the Sata Square, it can be used to symbolise the Christian concept of God as the Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, and they are used in Christianity to denote God being present at the beginning and the end of history, and at every moment in between. In the Christian scriptures in the book of Revelation, Jesus states this explicitly when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Interestingly, these exact same three things are true of the protagonist in Tenet. In fact, the protagonist is a type of Christ in this story, but I'll come back to that point later in the video. While we're speaking of the Sata Square as a coded symbol, let's not forget the symbolism of clasping your hands together that appears in Tenet. This is a way of showing other people that you are part of that secretive community, 
hiding itself from the rest of the world, just like the early Christians did. And the last thing of note about the Seta Square is that two of the most well-known examples of it were unearthed during excavations of the island of Pompeii. As astute watchers of the film will know, Pompeii features prominently in the plot of Tenet. Now there's one other really important piece of the puzzle that I think is essential for understanding the plot of Tenet. And that's the fact that the protagonist was supposed to die in the terrorist attack on the Opera House at the very start of the film. The only reason he was saved was because an inverted kneel shoots and kills the terrorist who was about to kill the protagonist in the Opera House. This is actually a really important moment in the story and it makes sense of the events that come after the Opera House siege. Firstly, when the protagonist awakens from his coma on the boat, the first thing Fay, his CIA boss, says to him is, Welcome to the afterlife. Then just moments later, standing on the deck of the boat, he tells him again, You don't work for us, you're dead. This is an important point, and it is later reinforced when Priya tells the protagonist to get anywhere near Sator would take a fresh-faced protagonist, and you are as fresh as a daisy. The reason he's as fresh as a daisy is because he is completely foreign to this part of human history due to the fact that he was supposed to have previously died in the Opera House attack. And then of course there is Priya's reference to the protagonist being as fresh as a daisy. That's the very same flower in the phrase, pushing up the daisies, which is a traditional way of saying that someone is dead and buried. I think that when Faye tells the protagonist that he has passed a test that not everybody passes, he isn't simply referring to the fact that the protagonist chose to sacrifice himself to save others. It seems to me that he's also referencing the fact that the protagonist is the ideal candidate for the mission to stop Sator because the protagonist is foreign to the events that are about to unfold. He has passed the test of being resurrected into a place in the timeline where he has the ability to write his own new and completely unplanned destiny into that timeline that lies ahead. He is the only one with the power to defeat Sator because he is a previous unknown and that makes him the only confounding factor that is capable of completely upending Sator's plan to destroy the world. As the protagonist says of Sator when planning the highway truck heist with Neil, his ignorance is our only protection. It is my contention that Sator is ignorant of the protagonist at vital moments in the story precisely because the protagonist was supposed to have been killed on two occasions before those events unfolded. The first death was supposed to happen in the Opera House, but the inverted Neil shot and killed the terrorist before the protagonist could be killed. The second death was supposed to happen on the railway tracks when the protagonist swallowed the suicide capsule, but on that occasion he was saved because the capsule had been swapped out for a sedative. If he hadn't swallowed that sedative, then it seems that the terrorists would have kept on torturing and then eventually just killed him, so the test is found in the fact that he was willing to sacrifice himself for the good of others. By doing that, he passes the test and finds his path to resurrection and to becoming the saviour of the world. Remember how I said he was Christ-like? Well, that railway track is his Garden of Gethsemane. If he had refused to swallow the capsule, he would have failed the test because the terrorists would have actually killed him for real instead, and he wouldn't have been there to stop Sator after that moment. The reason Tenet exists before all of that unfolds is because the protagonist from the future has already put everything necessary in place for the Tenet program to be established in the past, which includes recruiting Neil and the others. So it is essential that the protagonist passes that initial test with the suicide capsule to ensure that he is around to complete the rest of the mission. And for those who are wondering, interfering with those events by saving him directly from the terrorists on the railway track would jeopardise the mission as well, because it would introduce the possibility of the protagonist acting in new and problematic ways that would produce a different outcome other than the demise of Sator and the salvation of the world. 
The reason this doesn't matter after he has swallowed the suicide pill and so it becomes safe to tell him about the Tenet program is because in the original timeline he was supposed to have died before that point. And that means that what happens after his resurrection is all brand new and there is nothing pre-existing to interfere with in the unfolding arc of his character and the timeline ahead. Well, that's my theory anyway, and I'm sticking to it. Now, remember earlier when I made that point about the protagonist being a type of Christ in this film? Well, just consider the parallels. He has sacrificed himself to save others. He is resurrected after dying that sacrificial death. He is willing to sacrifice himself again at the end of the film to save the whole world. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end of this story. He proclaims a transcendent moral law and refuses to do evil in order that good may come of it. And he preaches a message of hope and the possibility of redemption from evil for all mankind. Meanwhile, Sator is like a type of antichrist in this film. His life is one of self-gratification. He is the malevolently evil presence in this story. He is willing to steal, kill and destroy. His mission is to annihilate the world and everyone in it. He literally declares himself to be like God in the final act of the film. And he does all of this as a type of jealous revenge. If I can't have what I want, then I will set myself on destroying everything that is good, true and beautiful. One of the most telling aspects of the character of Sator is his use of the Goya painting to enslave Cat and her son Max. Here you have a character who is corrupting something beautiful and good in order to use it as a tool of oppression. This is literally the very epitome of Satan's modus operandi in the Christian story of history. Just like Sator, the devil is the corrupter of the good who seeks to oppress and enslave people with the bonds of sin and evil. What makes this all the more fascinating is that Cat was seduced into Sator's grip. Her infatuation with the repo, the forger, led her to be taken in by a forged Goya painting and that leads directly to her enslavement by Sator. In this way, Cat is a type of Eve from the Jewish and Christian scriptures, who is seduced by the serpent in the garden and then becomes enslaved in the snare of original sin as a result. Another important moment of dialogue happens when Sator tells Cat, anger scars over into despair. I look in your eyes, I see despair. That is the very gospel of Sator, the gospel of despair. And here he is telling her that she has been enslaved and rendered powerless by her despair and her lack of hope. And speaking of the character of Cat, she is the character who is also the embodiment of all of humanity in this film. I've already mentioned that in the story she is a type of Eve, the first human woman and the mother of all humanity in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. But there's also the fact that in this film, just like the fate of all humanity, the protagonist is ultimately trying to save Cat from the grip of Sator's evil. Even after Sator has been killed, the protagonist still has to save Cat from that same evil by stopping Priya before she can then kill Cat. And did you notice that there is a kind of notion of prayer in the concept of uttering your cry for help into a cell phone which is heard by a messianic figure of the protagonist across time and space? To save Cat is to save humanity from the evil of Sator, the evil of despair, the evil of believing that killing innocent people can be a good thing as long as the outcome is good for you. In this way, Tenet is a film which ultimately puts the moral philosophies of utilitarianism and consequentialism on trial and then finds them severely wanting. As the old thought experiment goes, would you kill the baby Hitler if you could travel back in time and find yourself standing over his crib as he sleeps? The utilitarian and the consequentialist would reply, of course I would, because killing this one baby would save the world from the evils and sufferings of Nazism. Leaving aside the obvious problem of whether this would actually prevent someone else from simply taking Hitler's place and following a similar or possibly even worse trajectory, to even contemplate doing this to another innocent human being 
is itself an act of corrupting evil. The moment I kill an innocent baby in order to try and achieve good in the world and build a better future for humanity is the very moment I start doing exactly what Hitler did. He killed millions of innocents in his demonic quest to quote unquote save humanity and make the world a better place for those who would live on afterwards. If I adopt the same evil tactics of the monster I am fighting against, then I also become an evil monster. To kill Hitler as a baby in order to make the world a better place would be to become a type of Hitler yourself, a person who is willing to kill innocent human beings to satisfy a utopian goal. The ultimate salvation of humanity rests in us resisting the evil of doing evil things, regardless of what the outcome of doing those evil things will be. Stopping evil by doing evil is itself evil. Any good outcome that might result from our evil deeds doesn't change that fact or make the evil we have done into a good. As the protagonist says to Cat when discussing the act of killing, it always counts. This is dramatically spelled out in the film when the protagonist initially resists Cat's attempt to kill Sator, and he instead turns the boat around to save him from certain death in the water. In doing that, humanity has literally been saved from ultimate destruction in that moment. This is important because moral action is a central theme in this story, and unlike other time travel films, Tenet is a movie that firmly rejects the notion of determinism. We are explicitly told in the first act of this film, during the scenes with the bullet in the lab, that the actions which unfold in this story are not predetermined. They simply appear that way because of our perception of time. If, however, we could view time differently, then we would realise that there is still someone with agency who has free will and is making choices which lead to the various outcomes in this story. This is reinforced again in a much more dramatic way in the final act of Tenet, when Cat prematurely kills Sator and the rest of the team employ their free will to make new and different choices that still result in a victorious outcome. This authentic vision of free will is vitally important to the issue of human moral action and the moral philosophy that Tenet delves into. The people of the future who are trying to destroy the world of the past are ultimately determinists who have fallen into the same despair that Sator has. They refuse to believe that human beings are capable of making different and better choices to bring about an alternative future, so they have decided to annihilate them instead. Sato expresses this concept in another way when he says that his greatest sin was to bring a son into a world that he knew was going to end. Sadly, this exact same ideology of despair and determinism is not uncommon in our modern Western culture. There is even a group who refer to themselves as antinatalists and wear their refusal to have children as a badge of honour. Now the protagonist, on the other hand, is a type of Christ who rejects such despair and preaches a gospel of hope instead. In fact, he tells Sator that without hope and a belief in God, a future, or something greater than his own experience, he is not human, he is simply a madman. To which Sator replies, or a god. That entire phone conversation between Sator and the protagonist in the final act is an extremely fascinating and important one. It touches on and rejects determinism, nihilism, atheism and empiricism. And it seems to me that the talk of religious belief, madmen and human beings becoming gods in that conversation is a not so subtle and very powerful reference to, and ultimately a rejection of, the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche and the will to power. This particular evil dominates the story of Tenet, and it isn't just Sator who is corrupted by it. Priya is also driven by this same ideology of the will to power, to the point where she is still trying to kill an innocent woman even after Sator has been defeated. And boy does she have a fascinating conversation with the protagonist in that final scene in the car. 
The first thing the protagonist does is to question and pass judgment on the flawed morality of Priya, who was about to murder Cat, by asking her, that's your idea of mercy? This is a damning indictment of utilitarianism and consequentialism and their serious moral failings, not least of which is the will to power and the outcome of might makes right. He then goes on to admonish Priya for thinking that it was her job to tie up the loose ends, telling her that tying up loose ends is his job. If we see the protagonist as a type of Christ, then Priya is representative of humanity in that conversation, and the protagonist is warning her that her role is not to play God. This speaks directly to one of the greatest flaws with utilitarianism and consequentialism. You see, without a divine godlike knowledge of the future, how can anyone possibly know which present day actions would produce greater good in the world and which ones would produce greater evil and suffering? Sure, committing an evil act such as killing the baby Hitler might seem like a good idea from our limited view of the world, but what if killing that baby simply stops one evil and then introduces a whole new and far greater evil and suffering into the world. We can't possibly know the answer to that question, and so we should not be trying to tie up loose ends in a utopian way where the end justifies the means and evil acts become permissible in the name of making the world a better place. Which brings me to an even deeper and more subtle theme in Tenet. It seems to me that it's actually also a critique of cultural Marxism and its vision of the world which claims that the past is an inherent evil which must be absolutely destroyed at any cost in order to save the world. One of the central tenets of cultural Marxism and the critical theory which underpins it is the belief that evils and oppressions of today are caused by the people of the past and that the only way to free the world of today is to completely dismantle the past so that it no longer exists. In this way, cultural Marxism promotes a terrible and dangerously simplistic reductionism which fixates solely on the evils while refusing to acknowledge any of the goods that were also present or given to us from the past. When the past is viewed through the lens of cultural Marxism, there is no sense of hope, simply a deep and overwhelming sense of despair about any present day evils that have emanated from it. And just like the antagonists in Tenet, cultural Marxism rejects the idea that there is any good worth saving in the past, and instead sets itself about rewriting history and destroying all that has come before in the name of making the world a better place. We saw a similar theme touched on during another Christopher Nolan film, The Dark Knight Rises, when Bane takes over Gotham City and kangaroo courts are quickly established to pass death sentences on those who are deemed to be the privileged oppressors of the people of Gotham. The parallels of this to other violent revolutionary movements stemming from the Enlightenment are pretty obvious for anyone who knows their history or just watches current affairs. What Tenet seems to be saying to us is that despite the evils that happened in the past, we should never fall into despair and lose hope about the future, because there is still good in the world, and that good is worth fighting for. We are not merely helpless and oppressed victims of past events, instead we possess the agency to reject evil and bring about change for the good if we choose to do so. Therefore, we should reject the temptation to embrace overly simplistic utopian social revolutions which believe that the end justifies the means, even when that means is violent, brutal and bloody revolution. Which brings me to the final thing that struck me about Tenet, and that is the fact that it seems to parallel the Lord of the Rings in some fairly significant ways. Firstly, there is a ring of power in this story, the algorithm, which can be used to dominate and rule over all of reality, and which has to be destroyed in order to save the world. In the Lord of the Rings, nine different rings of power were made for the world of men. In Tenet, the algorithm is made of nine different parts. Then there is Priya, who is like the character of Saruman, 
in that she becomes corrupted by the ring of power and also rejects the chance of redemption when it is offered to her. Which highlights another parallel with The Lord of the Rings, where just like the protagonist in Tenet, there is a constant testing of various characters going on which indicates whether they have the virtue necessary to save the world from the evil of the Ring of Power. Sadly, most do not. We also have a fellowship of characters in this story who each have a different yet vitally important role to play in bringing about the demise of the Ring of Power, the algorithm. We see this most clearly at the very end of the final battle with the characters of Neil, Ives and the protagonist. And then there is Sator, who has a type of Sauron-esque demonic oversight of world affairs that makes him extremely powerful. And that's not the end of the similarities. The relationship between the protagonist and Neil strongly parallels that of Frodo and Sam in The Lord of the Rings. The protagonist is just like Frodo in that he is given the task of destroying the Ring of Power, while Neil is like Sam, who assists the protagonist and ultimately saves him from defeat at the end, just as Sam does for Frodo in The Lord of the Rings. Most importantly of all, though, is that Tenet shares Tolkien's vision of good and evil and his unwavering commitment to hope which permeates the story of The Lord of the Rings. At one pivotal moment in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo opines that things would have been better for the world if Bilbo had simply stabbed and killed Gollum which Gandalf strongly rebukes when he says, Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. Then later in The Lord of the Rings, this exact same point is strongly reinforced again when Sam suggests that they should tie up Gollum and leave him for dead because leaving him alive could result in their deaths. In that moment, those exact same lines of dialogue from Gandalf are repeated, this time by Frodo. Just like The Lord of the Rings, Tenet is a story where the end does not justify the means, and the morality of our actions is about how we act, not simply what outcomes our actions might bring about. The will to power, might makes right, the end justifies the means, are the corrupting evils of the ring of power, or the algorithm. Then in The Return of the King, there is this line of dialogue that could have easily come directly from the mouth of the protagonist in Tenet. It is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succour of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. In other words, it's not our job to tie up the loose ends. We are simply supposed to strive to live what is good and what is true. And of course, who could forget this often quoted piece of wisdom from Gandalf when he reminds the doubting Frodo that Middle Earth is not a world of blind determinism. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. Look, there's a lot more that could be said about Tenet, but this video is already much longer than I originally envisaged, so let me just end, just like the film does, by going all the way back to the very beginning and reiterating my first point. Tenet is another cinematic masterpiece from Christopher Nolan. I love this film. With Tenet, Nolan has once again proven that he is interested in making more than just mindless action flicks. For Nolan, the spectacle and the action set pieces are the foundations upon which he layers his mythology, and that mythology is always focused on exploring the deep and important themes of the human experience. In Tenet, it was the themes of morality and hope. So with that in mind, I'll leave the final word to Samwise Gamgee from The Two Towers because I think that the following quote from him perfectly sums up the fight against despair which permeates the story of Tenet, making it such a great piece of mythology about the virtue of hope. It's like in the great stories, Mr Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end, 
because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. Don't forget to like, share and give this video a thumbs up, that all helps the channel. And wherever you're watching, please subscribe. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the little notifications bell as well. That way you'll get updated about every new piece of content that we publish. A huge thank you to everyone who is supporting us at patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help to ensure that this great content keeps happening. So that's patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia, as little as a dollar a month or as much as you'd like to contribute. And a huge thank you, as I said, to everyone who made today's episode possible. You guys are awesome. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media.